Bezrat Hashem, with Hashem's loving grace, welcome to our weekly Likutei Moran Shur. Tonight, we are learning the second part of Likutei Moran, the second section, Torah 19. Torah 19 is one of Rebbe Nachman's cardinal Torahs. It's a real important principle to serving Hashem. It's a very foundation principle to Breslava Hasidus, Rebbe Nachman's particular way of serving Hashem. And the lesson is entitled, The Beauty of Simplicity. Now, we know that the closest place between two points is a straight line. And nothing is more straight than, nothing more simple than a straight line. Straight line, it's, it, in, it's simplicity. It's utter simplicity in uh, geometry. And it also represents honest innocence. When a person is honest, you say he's straight, a straight person. And there's a difference. Why do you say honest innocence? There could be something like innocence that's a naive type of innocence. It's not innocence out of brains. It's not innocence out of like moral type innocence. But a person who is morally innocent, I call honest innocence, this is what Rebbe Nathan is talking about. So he talks about two traits, simplicity and honest innocence. In Hebrew, he calls them tmimut and pshitut. We're going to learn all about them tonight. And these two traits make a person beautiful. I don't care what the person's physical appearance is. If a person has these two traits, he has he or she has simplicity, and they have honest innocence, they're beautiful because they're purity. It's a purity. And just like it's a straight line between two points, it's a straight line between a person's soul and a shem. The shortest distance between a person's soul and a shem is with these two, with this simplicity, the straightest line, that's the straightest line. And so that brings us, these two traits bring us close to the creator. And that's why Rebbe Nachman emphasizes them. Okay, so we start in Likute Moran. And Rabbi Nachman says first, Ikara Tachlit Vashlemut, who Rakla voted Hashem between Mut Gumul Blishum Hochmot. Rabbi says the ultimate goal and perfection are nothing other than serve Hashem with absolute, simple innocence, without any shrewdness. Any shrewdness, what we call in Hebrew, kombinot, and get glad when a person makes combinations and is a wheeler dealer. There's no wheeler dealing and, and not, not to show off how clever you are and no shrewdness, just Simple innocence and honesty. Rabbi Nachman says, yeah. We take, let's take the most pseudo intellectual, they think they're intellectual, but they're pseudo intellectual. The pseudo intellectual group of people are the philosophers. And the philosophers, they're far from theology, that their philosophy, they, they think their brain is the utmost. And they think that the epitome of knowledge and the ultimate goal even to the world to come is to know something, know something with their, with their brains to, like, for example, take a star, to know what a star is and know everything about it, know inside and know outside. But their knowledge doesn't go past their eyesight. Their knowledge doesn't transcend human intellect. Their knowledge stays within the realm of a human intellect. It's like a little frog in a muddy pond. And little frog lives all his life in that muddy pond. And he thinks the whole universe is that muddy pond. He never leaves it. Okay, so these are the philosophers. Rabbi Nachman explains. explains what do they believe in. Rabbi Nachman is using the language of the philosophers. I want to that couldn't stop Rabbi Nachman's explanation in the beginning. Now we'll explain it and exactly what he's talking about. Rabbi Nachman says these are the people that they want to know an object. Uh, it's a, okay, they, they, the, they have the, they say the person have three types of the, the, their goal. They want the person that knows something. That's the important thing. The object that is to be known. And the intellect, all about the object. This is what Rabbi Nachman is saying. This is the, the three planes. That they're, they're the center because they're the one, the knower, the knower, and the knowee, that's the subject that they're supposed to know about, and the knowledge about it. This is their whole world. And this is, they think, 
this is the world to come, to get to know things, to know all about a star, to know all about a chemical compound, to know all about that they know all about whatever. And at all times they're into doing research and they're searching. And they're again, everything is in with the realm of their own intellect. Okay. So for them, the knower and the known and the knowledge, they become one. That's their one. Our oneness is a shem. That's a shem. Their oneness is their intellect. That the person who knows and what they know and what they know about. So they spend all their days looking into this, looking into this thing. They'll see what 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 makes what makes a drip of water make a splash. This is the, the philosophical thing. Now that this philosophy, what makes a drip of water cause a splash, and how big a splash, and that what makes the drip of water cause the ripples. And they'll spend day and night. And you see, this is no joke. The universities, they'll, they'll spend, you could do a department of physics. They might get a, a, a federal grant of millions of dollars to find out what makes the ripples in the water. These are the same universities with the thing. With two, the, 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 they're, they're, they're demonstrating against Israel, but they don't know what they're demonstrating about. They're yelling about the, the, the sea uh, to, from the river to the sea. They don't know what river, they don't know what sea. This is such the pseudo intellectual knowledge and it's such a waste of time. And poor parents are spending fifty, sixty thousand dollars a a year tuition. That people go to the Poison Ivy League and uh, Poison Ivy League school. Uh, and, and for what? For what? For they say uh, the, uh, the super intellect. They think that the, the intellect is all theirs. That they don't realize. They don't realize. That Hashem is laughing at them. Hashem is laughing that that these are the the frogs in a pound uh, in in a pond. Intellectual level. Because they're engaging in their and phys phys philosophical inquiry to know these truths, they don't build a single thing in the world. They don't improve the world any single way. You take all the philosophy and it's it's all like like bubbles, bubbles in the air. But in anything, they 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 think that this is a weight. This is a this. Uh, Gan Eden, this uh, nirvana of knowledge is awaiting them in the world to come. They believe in a world to come, but they have a world to come, their type of world to come, where they're in their parlor meetings on Thursday night, the cup of coffee and whatever they're doing, smoking their nargila, whatever they, they do. And they're having, you know, they're intellectuals. Uh, excuse me, uh, philosophical friends, what, what have you built? What have you done? What have Kidrim decided? Nothing. But it's all the thing, in, looking into it, looking into it, looking into it. And they won't, when, for example, when it comes to uh, Rabbi Nachman soon talk about the practical mitzvot, there's no such thing as a practical mitzvot. They won't observe a Shabbat, or they won't put on tefillin, or they won't give charity. No, but they'll see what is the inner meaning of charity. They won't give charity. Put your hand in your pocket, mister, and take out a coin and put it in the poor person's palm. No, they won't do that. What's the inner meeting and what does it cause in the metal cosmic physical worlds when he puts his hand in the pot? Come on. It's what they're all busy with. And it's funny, the entire world is doing this. Like I say, if, if you look at, look at the federal grants to universities and what they're giving money for, you can't believe it. So notwithstanding, uh, they are enclosed in a body. The delight they have from their physical inquiry is minimal. They realize, okay, they don't have a delight, but, 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 they, but the delight is going to be in the next world when they leave the body and their whole being is going to be the intellect, the intellect, the intellect. Okay, they don't call it the soul. They don't recognize the soul. They think the intellect, that the intellect is their, their whole nature. And what do they think the intellect? They think it becomes from them. Hey, excuse me, did you create your brain? Did you give yourself an intellect? It is so that a second grader, a second grader with a straight mind can take apart everything they learn. But that's it. They're waiting for the day. They have the great delight when nothing is and what is these other than intellect. So according to their, their really despicable ideas, because they, they're decadent ideas, their ideas lead to decadence. Uh, then they'll do to decay, to, to, to try to expand their minds and to try to expand their minds. And they'll look, oh, they see, hey, wait a second. If they smoke a certain substance or take a certain pill or a certain chemical, they can expand their minds. And many of them go off into <laughs> substance, substance use. So they reach, they think they can reach their goal by secular wisdom. 
with the, the human wisdom. And the problem, once again, is that their philosophy is human intellect and it's secular wisdom. And what's the problem with secular wisdom? Secular wisdom is below the stars. It's confined to nature. You can't go, can't transcend. And where Amuna starts, they don't even they don't even begin because Amuna starts past nature. As soon as the brain gives out, that's where Amuna begins. And Amuna is the gate to divine wisdom. That's why we spend all this time learning Amuna. We'll see more about what it really means to learn Amuna. We'll take their philosophy and we'll see what it means to compare Amuna to their philosophy. Okay, Rabbi Nachman continues. I know it sounds it sounds cryptic, but in a minute it's going to get all clear because when you just talk about them, in other words, we're not to teach about it. It's disgusting to even talk about it. But Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman will explain exactly where he's coming to. But what's the show? Who they are? This is the, for, for example, there's a, there's a story, a classic story. There's a classic story uh, about Plato that, uh, no, it's not Plato, it was Socrates. Okay. Socrates was in a gutter in Rome, drunk as a skunk. And uh, in, in Greece, excuse me. It was a gutter in Greece, drunk as a skunk. And his students looked at him and they say, uh, our master, is that you? Are, are you Socrates? He looks like him, but you're all muddy and dirty. He says, in the study hall, I'm Socrates. And out here, I'm just a, a drunk. That's it. That's the difference between their philosophy and Amuna. And Amuna, your day and night, 24 hours a day, your soul is connected to Hashem. And day and night, you're the son or daughter of a king. It's not like that where it's just an intellectual exercise. When we talk about guarding our tongue, we talk about morals, we talk about immorality, we talk about uh, everything, about, about purity. This is part of our lives. It's the way we breathe. It's the air we breathe. And this begins with divine knowledge because divine knowledge, which, so how do we plug in divine knowledge? That's by way of the Torah. And, but you can't plug into it if you don't believe in it. That's Emunah. So Emunah is the gateway to Torah and Torah takes us to Hashem. So we see that uh, they cannot attain, that they cannot begin to attain our goal. And the only way to attain a true intellect, which is a, a, what we call spiritual awareness, that's a muna, the dot, spiritual awareness, is by way of a muna and practical mitzvah observance. This is what Rabbi Nachman teaches us, to serve God according to the Torah. And here, Rabbi Nachman says, with simplicity and honest in, innocence. So he says in the next paragraph. And through this, we merit a level, like he says, And we put the philosophers aside, and let's look how we get to real knowledge. Philosophers talk about knowledge, knowing, and knowing something, and I'm the person that knows, and the knowledge I have, you know nothing. You know nothing. In fact, your knowledge can't compare to the instinct of an animal. Instinct of an animal is much more accurate than your knowledge. The animal doesn't uh, debate uh, which side of the room is my food trough, or to which side of the barn is my food trough. It knows right there. No philosophy. The exact practical is straight. Okay, so he's not even the level of an animal. So when we serve Hashem, according to the Torah, with simplicity and honest innocence. Once again, these are the two characters that make a person beautiful. Simplicity and honest innocence. Do you ever feel when you're speaking to someone that's honest and speak with someone that's simple and speak with someone that doesn't have all kinds of angles and all kinds of ulterior motives and advantages, a friend that's simple with honest innocence. It's like fresh air. It's a such a friend like that is like fresh air. That that's the best friend you could have. So Rabbi Nachman says, when a person serves Hashem through simplicity and through honest innocence, he attains a level that Isaiah explains in chapter sixty four of Isaiah, a level that no human eye has seen. I in lo lo so yaset, and it's talking about a level of that a person normally reaches only in the next world, in Garden of Eden. But when a person serves Hashem with simple, with simplicity and with honest innocence, he gets because he's simple and he knows that he knows nothing. The holy Arizal, as much as he was the father of Kabbalah, 
and he knew the secrets of creation. He could look at a person and he knew the person's go rounds since Adam and Eve, because we all go back to Adam and Eve. And he could see this on a person's forehead. He was so brilliant, but he was so simple and happy. And it's because Ibar Arisal explains, he says, he says that the epitome of knowledge is knowing that we know nothing. That's the epitome of knowledge, knowing that we know nothing. And this is what Rabbi Nachman quotes the Arizal many times in that. And this is to know, because where do you pour fine wine? You take a nice clean goblet and you take your fantastic bottle of uh, Chateau, Chateau Merlot from maybe 10 years ago and pour it into clean glass. You don't pour it into muddy glass. To take the philosopher's brains are like muddy glasses. It's got all this garbage, no room for divine light. When we serve Hashem with simplicity, we know, we know nothing, and that all the knowledge is in Torah and all the knowledge is by Hashem, and we put aside all the secular knowledge, then we fill ourselves with divine light. We're able to absorb Torah and learn Torah and get close to Hashem. And this really shines. This gives us an emuna intellect, which is an intellect that far surpasses the human intellect, and it gives an insight into the world to come. Now you can understand the greats of Israel, how they can they could see, they feel things that things they're, they're happening. They could see, they know what's coming. They could look at a person and, and say this is on the higher spiritual level. It's just like a person that's standing on a higher mountain. He could see further than someone standing down the valley when he's standing up on the mountain. Okay, this is what Isaiah means in, in verse 3 of chapter 64, that no eye has seen it. No human eye has seen it. When a person is privy to divine knowledge, he could see this. So Rabbi Nachman explains, he brings what, what King David says in Psalm 111 and verse 10, that the beginning of wisdom is the reverence of Hashem. You think that people say the fear of Hashem, I think a better translation is the awe or the reverence of Hashem. When a person reveres Hashem, why, awestruck. You just think of Hashem and you take a deep breath. It, 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 Hashem is so awesome. It's not that you're a fear, a person fears every moment that a bolt of lightning is going to come down from the heaven, hit him in the head if he doesn't do right. That is not what Rabbi Nachman is talking about. When he talks about Yerat Shemaim, Yerat Hashem, we're talking about the reverence of Hashem, the deep respect and awe of Hashem. Rabbi Nachman continues, Viteida. It's, you should know. Anytime the Rabbi Nachman says da, he uses his words sparingly. But we're talking about a fact, physical fact, and a medical physical fact. She'en You should know that it's not like what the philosophers say. It's the exact opposite. Heaven forbid, Rabbi Nachman says, Kim ken lo yasigu atachlit rak matei ma'at mo'od mo'od da'inu abal sechel v'filosochim ma she'en k'tanea erech she'en lem sechel kaze lachkor ha'kirot ladata moskolot she'em rov v'ikar olam ve'en yasigu et atachlit. Rabbi Nachman says that you should know that the whole matter is not like what the philosophers say. Heaven forbid. Because if it was like what they say, maybe a few could attain this level of, of godly knowledge, maybe a Benjamin Franklin or a, or a Thomas Edison or, or, or somebody like that, somebody brilliant or an Albert Einstein. But Albert Einstein, he, he didn't attain it. He didn't attain it. He was far. Albert Einstein didn't did, did keep shopping. He didn't have to say it. So even Brain of Einstein didn't. Rabbi Nachman was saying philosophically, but he said, even if you want to say, Rabbi Nachman was talking the way they argue in the Gemara, assume, assume that a person with 150 IQ could attain divine knowledge, which he can't. Okay. Then what about the, all the regular people? People with 100, 105 IQ, normal people. They go around, people that, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the local grocery guy and, the, and the, the cab driver and the mailman, the local people, you know, just nice people, regular people, the guy at the shoe store, regular people. How, what are they supposed to do? That only the big philosophers with the 150 IQ, that that's five, you know, the way IQ works is every 10 points in IQ is a standard deviation. So only 1.4 of 1% of uh, the entire population. In other words, 99.6 of the population are below a 130 IQ. Only four tenths of a percent are above a 130 IQ. So you could 140 IQ, that's almost not there. And a 150 IQ, it's impossible. 
And 100 standard deviation, the average IQ of a human being is 100. Okay, that's the average IQ in the world. So the majority of people in the world, they can't attain it. Rabbi Nava says, even if you want to say that the geniuses could attain divine knowledge, but, but with the, the, philosoph the philosophers, oh, you got, you got to be a philosopher, you have to be one of them. But they're all pseudo-intellectual. See the difference between a philosophy book and the difference between a book written by a Torah great like Rabbi Fadi Yosef, or if you see the, the Melitzer Rebbe's uh, books on, on, on religious law, on the looks on Hasidus, you can understand them. They're not using, they're not using, they're written to understand, they're written to teach. You ever try to read a philosopher's book, a philosophy book, it'd be fall asleep in the, after the first paragraph. All these six syllable words and all the, the, the ultra metaphysical, anti establishedarianism but all, all, these, all these silly words that mean nothing. It mean nothing. It's like uh, they say, the, 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 the morning clouds, they dissipate. They dissipate. So Rabbi Nachman now goes back once again to his principle. He says this over and over again. Aval emet, be'emet, ikar asagata tachlit urak edei t'mimot daika. Dehainu yirat shamayim mitzvot masiyot upshitut gomor. He re-emphasized all the time that the attainment of the ultimate goal is specifically through simplicity. In other words, the reverence of God and fulfilling the practical mitzvahs with pure innocence. And that means no angles. Don't be a wise guy. And like we say in Hebrew, combino, no combino, and, and no ulterior motives, no personal interests of gain. You know, what do I get out of this? What, what's in the deal for me? What's it in for me? No, none of that stuff. None of that stuff. Okay, this is what Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman says when uh, he quotes King Solomon in Ecclesiastes. King Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, Sof devar kol nishma et elokim yere, elokim yere, bit mitzvot hav shmo, kizek kol adam. So Shlomo Melech, he's teaching us. Shlomo Melech was the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth. And the IQ, there's not even IQ to measure because he had divine wisdom. King Solomon had divine wisdom. And King Solomon, a blessed memory, he says like this, ultimately, ultimately, that, that, what's our, our goal? Is that after everything is seen and heard, revere Hashem and keep his commandments for this is the entire person. This is the entire person. This is, this, in other words, this is a whole mission on life. And this is what gets us into the highest place in the world to come. So King Solomon, that, that's the game plan. So by means, Rabbi Nachman goes ahead and stresses it for the fourth time for simplicity and honest innocence. That's to fear Hashem and to observe his mitzvah in truth and simplicity, devoid of sophistication, sophistry. Philosophy, in other words, don't be a wise guy and don't be a wheeler deer. Okay, <laughs> what do they say? Keep it real, bro. <laughs> That's it. Rabbi Nachman said, keep it real, bro. So now he continues, and this explains what King Solomon is saying again: that uh, this is everything you haven't be heard. Revere Hashem, keep His commandments, the entire person. So Rabbi Nachman explains like this. He says, When King Solomon says, this is the entire person, it's also a play on words in Hebrew, is this is every person. So Rabbi Nachman says, this is something that every person can attain. Every person could be honest if he or she wants to. Every person could be simple if she wants to. And that way, what they, they can fear Hashem, they can revere Hashem, and they can fulfill His commandments, whether it's the Torah 613, whether it is the seven Noahide, uh, seven Noahide mitzvahs. The Rambam teaches, by the way, seven Noahide mitzvahs. The Rambam teaches us that they're actually much, much more. If we had looked just into the first mitzvah of the first Noahide mitzvah of believing in Hashem and not doing any idolatry, the Rambam lists that that is connected to 51 mitzvahs in the Torah. So the seven is not actually seven. When a person upholds that mitzvah, the person is actually upholding 51 mitzvahs in the Torah. And the whole thing, the Rambam lists it in the beginning of uh, his chapter, in the chapter on, uh, on serving Hashem and idolatry, what is permit permissible, what's not permissible. And he says that this breaks down to 51. 51 of the 613 mitzvahs have to do with uh, not doing idolatry. 
and that even that, that doing idolatry, that's not doing idolatry. There's other mitzvahs believe, believing in Hashem, and if, if there's so you get a, a Noahide who really is careful about keeping the Noahide laws, and that's why uh, they were so important to Rabbi Nachman. They were so important to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and we put so much emphasis on that because it's emuna. Emuna is the is the first mitzvah of the Torah, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, and it is the common denominator between the Noahide and the Jew. That we're both required to amun the same thing for Noah and the Jew. Believe in Hashem, same thing. Okay, there's no difference in the way we have to believe in Hashem. So since the simplicity and innocence in serving Hashem, this is a part of Amuna, this is for, for all of us. Okay, and for that reason, Rabbi Nachman says, if our goal is not the sophistry, being a wise guy, being an intellect, and showing the, the big vocabulary, long words, no, keep it real. If it's innocent, honesty and simplicity anyone it doesn't matter what their iq is they could go and they can uplift themselves unbelievably in other words it doesn't matter who you are if the whole world is down on you the whole world says that oh you're not smart that's it uh come on learn him one my brother learn him one my sister and we'll see where shem will take you up you think you're down the shem will take you up real high because if this is and when is for every single person there is not a single person on the world if hashem created the world the person and put him in the world then hashem gives them the opportunity to get close to him there's no such thing that a person doesn't have this this is a human being's birthright and the nations of the world and the philosophers, because it's so, so popular, it's just, look what's happening in, in America now, the, the Ivy League and in the West Coast and the UCLA and in Berkeley, it's all philosophy, philosophy, philosophy. And politically correct to believe in God? No way. You can, it's primitive. Look at the way they disdain uh, people that, uh, that believe in God, that they're simple and they're primitive. No they're the ones you'll see. There's going to be big surprises when Hashem reveals himself, when Mashiach reveals himself. And what the Gemara tells the tract, Baba Basra, that the people who consider themselves up, they're going to be down. And the people that think they're downtrodden, they're up. They're close. So this Rebbe Nachman system, and that's why Rebbe Nachman has so many followers. But I do in Uman, you, you see people, there's a lot of Noahides make it to Uman also. Rebbe Nachman has so many followers because it gives everyone. Rebbe Nachman is equal opportunity in Muna. And that's, the, that's what that, that's real Amuna. It's equal opportunity in Muna. It's colorblind, no background, wherever you are and wherever you live and whoever you are, you have a right that's your birthright because you've got a soul and your soul has a right to get close to Hashem. So there's nothing more beautiful, nothing more egalitarian, nothing so so wonderful as, as a Semuna. And this is the simplicity and the honest innocence that makes a person so beautiful because this simplicity and honest innocence connecting to a Muna, it means that you love every human being. And you don't look at a person's background, you don't look at this, that, that you know that they're a son or daughter of Hashem, you're a son or daughter of Hashem, you look at every human being like, like your brother. So people with real Amuna, they're the nicest people on earth. And even if physically, okay, they're not movie stars, but when you get to know someone, sometimes you get somebody that's so physically beautiful, take a uh, some Hollywood actor that's got bad character traits, he or she's got bad character, ugly. Okay, maybe they look glamorous on the screen, but ugly. And take a person, it's a plain looking person, but it's a kind, a generous, a wonderful person. They're beautiful because the soul shines through. The philosophy says, this is what Rebbe Nachman teaches. You want to be beautiful people? This Torah 19 is how to be beautiful people, how to be beautiful people. And it's a serve Hashem. So we got to go on to the second part of Torah 19. Okay. And Rebbe Nachman says, Uvemet. Rabbi Nachman says, in truth, being a philosopher or a sophist and studying the text of secular wisdom, heaven forbid, is a very serious prohibition. Rabbi Nachman explains that elsewhere in Likud Moran that studying secular uh, disciplines it like puts a, a straitjacket on the brain. It doesn't allow the brain to expand. That only Torah allows the brain to expand because uh, 
secular discipline that is below the star's disciplines, below the star's intellect, and it constricts a person's brain. But Rabbi Nachman says, don't try to learn all these wisdoms that the philosophers do, but he says a, a great tzaddik can learn the seven wisdoms. Make a break here. Seven wisdoms. Wait, right, Rabbi Nachman says seven wisdoms. You look at encyclopedia. What's the seven wisdoms? What's the seven wisdoms? So I had to take a, made a special effort. So you can't understand Torah 19 without the seven wisdoms. Where do you find the seven wisdoms? It's cryptic. Rabbi Nachman explains it. Rabbi Nachman he expects everybody to know this. Rabbi Nachman has the whole Torah in the back of his hand. The esoteric Torah, the written Torah, the oral Torah. It's got everything on the back of his hand. But the seven, King Solomon, the wisest man there was, King Solomon knew everything. He knew everything. King Solomon could have made computers if he wanted to. He could have made explosives if he wanted to. He knew everything. He knew physics, chemistry, he knew everything. He was the wise person ever worked in the world. So King Solomon says in Proverbs, a big secret. This is why we get to delve so deep into Torah. So deep, you just can't learn Torah like you, like you travel on, on I-95 or Route 66. King Solomon says in Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 1, Chachma banta beta, Chatzva amudea shiva. Listen to this. Wisdom has built her house and she has hewn out seven pillars. In other words, when wisdom built her house, that she carved out seven pillars. So this comes the Gaon of Vilna. The Gaon of Vilna explains from this that what King Solomon was talking about was the seven pillars of wisdom. And in order to find out what he wanted to, that I went through went through uh, Proverbs and then looked in the book called the Torah, which is the voice of the dove of King Solomon, of, of the, the, the Gaon of Vilna. And the Gaon of Vilna explains it. And even there, it's cryptic. But uh, what I'm doing, I, I took what King Solomon said and what the Gaon of Vilna explained in Kola Tour and brought it down to practical language. Now, Rabbi Nachman is talking about this. Rabbi Nachman's got this right on his cuff. Rabbi Nachman has this right here. So what we're talking about, here's the seven pillars of wisdom. The first is math and physics. The second is geology and chemistry. The Gona Villain puts it together. The third is biology, botany, and medicine. In other words, the biology and botany is applied. Okay, biology suits anatomy and physiology. And, and, and botany includes the medicinal plants. And it's all medicine. These all things they go into. The fourth is grammar and linguistics. The fifth is music and astronomy. What's music got to do with astronomy? Okay, listen to this, Nisim. The Gon tells us that, you know how you learn music? You go up to the highest mountain. This is the Gon of Vilna. Gon of Vilna talking about how to learn music. Go up to the highest mountain on a starry night, and you know the constellations, and concentrate so you can hear the movement of the stars and the melody they sing as they move through the firmament. This is the Gona Villain explaining wisdom. Wow, wow. So you can see that and this is the wisdom that the Levites in the Holy Temple knew. So if we would hear one time, one time, 32-part harmony of the Levites in the Holy Temple, we'd go crazy. We could throw away all our music. This, that, and this, we would say Tikkun Chatzot, Midnight Lamentations, with such crying, we couldn't miss it. Our, our souls would be so hungry. It's like if you didn't eat and somebody all of a sudden gave you your favorite food, and when you're halfway through the meal, they took it away and not going to give it to you anymore. And you're screaming out for food. I want more food. This is, again, one more. The soul hears this music and this music of the highest place. And where the stars, they're a little closer to heaven than we are. The stars get it. The stars have their melody as they go through the sky. Now, you know how, how Hashem killed uh, Sennacherib when he seized Jerusalem and uh, Hezekiah, the king, he turned to the wall. He said, Hashem, I can't fight this battle. I got to be in Koilo next morning. He was, he was a Torah scholar. And Hashem killed 180,000 of Sanchabra and the Assyrian soldiers. How did he do that? He enabled the sun to sing out loud, where only usually uh, the, the great Sadiqim can understand what the sun is singing when he goes through. And it, their Nashamas couldn't stand it. It was a blowout for their Nashamas. They were taking their 40 watt neshamas and zapping it with 100,000 watts of spiritual electricity and boom, they, 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 they died right there. So this is music and astronomy. 
It's amazing. It's amazing. The six is architecture and engineering. You ask yourself, look how magnificent building. How do they know how to build a holy temple? I don't think that they know. How can you hewn stone without using a metal instrument? They were they, they had to take stone out of a quarry without using metal because you're not allowed to put metal on a stone that goes into the altar in the holy temple. It's amazing. And the seventh is unbelievable. The seventh is spiritual psychology, the relationship between body and soul and soul and body. And psychology doesn't know this because it's spiritual psychology. Psychology doesn't recognize the soul. Hey, they're like it was Freud, uh, superego, ego, id. It's not the soul. We're talking about the soul and the relationship between the body and the soul. So who knew all of this? I'll tell you people who knew this. People, Sadiqim. Moses knew all this. Moses knew these seven types of chokhmah, seven types of, of wisdom. Uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai knew it. The Holy Arizal knew it. The Gaon of Vilna knew it. The Rambam knew it. Rabbi Nachman of Reslev knew it. They were uh, Amoreim, Shmuel, Shmuel, Rav, and Rabbi Yochanan, they knew it. And the military Rebbe's grandfather, the Shatzer Zayde, is somebody that lived <laughs> 60 years ago. He knew it also. You see his knowledge. He never learned. People ask him, but when it, where, where did he learn physics? Where did he learn astrophysics? Where did he learn? He he went to the to the the English that he was at, at the German space agency and told them that their computation of the moon's orbit around the Earth was two seconds off. They couldn't believe it. They said, "Where's this learned?" They checked it out, and it was right. They checked it out. He said, NASA, he argued with NASA. The NASA was 0.2 hundredths of a second off. He could, where did he learn this? It's all from Torah. This is a Gamora Rosh Hashanah. He knew all these things. And this is a, the Rambam. So let me explain to you. So why, okay, so Reb, so you might ask a question. And this is a question everybody asks in Torah 19. Okay, why does Rabbeinu say that only the great Tzadikim can learn the seven types of wisdom? If Rebbe, I want to learn it also. First of all, can you imagine they knew everything? They know uh, Rebbe Nachman knew all the mathematics, he knew all the physics, he knew all of the geography, he knew all of medicine, and, uh, all this. That they, they knew it all. They knew it all. The Rambam knew it all. That the Rambam he was a physician and he was a scientist. Where did they come off that? The Gona Vilna? The Gona Vilna, Kramer's law. Kramer, the Gona, that's the Gona Vilna's last name. It was it was Kramer? It still stands. Nobody ever dis disproved that. It's the law of physics. And Kramer, where did the Gona Vilna? They, he learned from the Gabor and Chulin everything. And you can't believe it. So a person asks, okay, why can't, why, why can't I learn this? Why can't I? The Melitz Rebbe told me a, an example story. And it's like this. You have, what's the Rambam's brain and a normal person's brain? Okay, he says there was a rich man and a poor man. And the rich man had a house with 12 rooms in it. And the poor man has one little shack. Okay, so the rich man added 12 rooms. The rich man added on another room. And he said, why? This is in the days where people would go out in the backyard and the outhouse. And in the winter, it's not always nice to, in, in Europe and in the Ukraine where, where they live to, to, to go to the outhouse and when it's in 20 below. That's not nice. So the rich man said he's going to add a room to the edge of the house. And he's going to put in there a, what is that? an outhouse, an in-house instead of an outhouse. An outhouse, they made his fixture and been that. So, wow, the servant, he saw that the boss, the boss did. You don't have to, you, you could go and you could use the in-house and you don't have to go to the outhouse. So he came home and told his wife, he said, you know what the boss did? What? He doesn't go out in the, in the middle of the night. Why do we have to go out in the middle of the night and freeze? Let's put our, uh, our WC in, in the house also. So in their little one-room cabin, they put in a corner, they made a little in-house and put a partition. Well, 24 hours didn't pass and their cabin stunk to high heaven. <laughs> and the boy said, what did you do? Look at that. This is, it, it smells. And we can't eat here. We can't do it. It smells terrible. And it says, well, what about the guy's house? The, 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 was it the, the, my master's house, my boss, it doesn't smell bad. So he goes to the boss and he says, boss, I, I did exactly what you did. I did exactly what you did. So the boss says, fool, we've got 13 rooms. We put it way in the corner. You've got one room. It's going to stink. So that's what the Rebbe, Mel Rebbe says. I said, the big tzaddikim, they've got a brain that's got 13 rooms in it. They've got a place to put this chokhmah. Okay, we, a normal person, this is what Rebbe Nachman was talking about, that Amun is for the normal person. It's not for a person with a brain of Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai. 
uh, or the Rambam or the Gona Vilna, it says uh, our, our brain is like one room. So let's take the path of simplicity and simple innocence, because that way we can make it up just as high. We don't have to go through you know, don't do the path of, of the Chochmot, the path of the seven wisdoms. That's the seven types of wisdom that Rabbi Nachman is referring to. You can see sometimes you can say, yeah, there's two words in Rabbi Nachman, Sheva Chochmot. He says that Sheva Chochmot, seven wisdoms. And we'll pass and go by. And hold it. That's why we can't run so fast. And to understand what Rabbi Nachman is talking about, this we had to go in a little bit deeper. And Rabbi Nachman continues, Mi shenichnas betoch ha-chokmot chas v'sholom yecholi pol sham. Who, a person that enters into these wisdoms, he is in danger of a big fall. Why? Ki even negev bekol chokma v'chokma shi p'chinat ha-malik. In every single wisdom, there's a light side and a dark side. It's got a light side where you can close to Hashem. And this is what the Rambam and the Rashbi and Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Nachman and the Baal Shem Tov and the Arizal knew how to stay on the, the right side. But there's a dark side. There's a dark side. And that's a Malik. For example, this is where the philosophers are. The philosophers, if they took their wisdom to do good for their fellow man, to do good for the world, they'd be on the light side. But they take their wisdom and it goes to arrogance. We're smarter than everyone else. They look down at lower people. They look at everybody is lower than them. Okay. So therefore, it goes to Amalek. And this is the danger, Rabbi Nachman says, if a person goes into these intellectual disciplines and doesn't stay on the light side, then he's going to fall into Amalek. And Amalek was a philosopher. And Amalek was a rationalist. Amalek was brilliant. He was brilliant. But he denied Hashem's existence. Yeah, he was a philosopher, and yeah, he's a brilliant, but he was intellectually, humanly brilliant. He didn't have brains to recognize Hashem. And that's what the Gemara, uh, the, the Gemara that's what Torah says. The Torah says in Vorim, in, in Kofhe, in, in chapter 25, that uh, when the Torah describes a Malik, he had no reverence of Hashem. He said, no Malik. Heaven forbid, he said, who's Hashem? No reverence of Hashem. So when the tzaddik learns this chokhmah, how does the tzaddik stay on keel, stay on the right path? By way of a munah. The tzaddik, when he learns physics, and he learns chemistry, and he learns music, and he learns astronomy, he holds on to a munah. He holds on to a munah. So therefore, his music is going to stay in the realm of Kedusha, in the realm of holiness. Because he forgets about the music, if he forgets about forgets about holiness for a moment, man, it can take him to all kinds of things. Oh, wait a second! This musician did something that's really neat or nice. He's his instrument and this and that, and he goes into to, to according to Kabbalah. According to Kabbalah, there's a big difference about whether you hold your guitar. You know, the guys that play the acid rock, they hold the guitar below the waist, and that's indicative. That's Brit, That's as a blemish on the holy covenant. But a person that plays in, in the holy temple, when they would play, they, they would hold it above their chest uh, against their heart. And this is, this is, it, 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 it's a big difference how they do it. Because they would all the time, emuna, emuna, emuna. Emuna in your physics, emuna in your chemistry. I'm not learning physics. I'm not learning chemistry. I'm learning the secrets of Hashem's universe. This is the way we look at it. Secrets of Hashem's universe. Learn how to be a better person. I'm not learning psychology. I'm learning how to connect my soul or to help my friend or my 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 whoever's close to me connect their soul to Hashem. This is it. It's all the time they are honed in on a moon. It's just like a plane, a plane that is on automatic pilot. And the way they do it now, the pilots have it easy. If you're flying from New York to LA, you leave New York and you get into the Detroit control tower, you vector Detroit, and then from Detroit, you go to Chicago, and then from Chicago, you go to Denver, and from Denver to, 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 to LA, go from vector to vector, hone into the vector, hone into the vector, that's emuna, 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 emuna. Whenever I am, my vector, my my navigation is honed in on emuna, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, it doesn't matter whether I'm cooking for Shabbat, emuna, I should make this food come out good. When you, when you have emuna while you're cooking, you could use salt instead of sugar. Hashem's going to make you take out the best, best, best thing you ever made. <laughs> you could say, this is the secret what we learned in the Gemara when uh, Hanina Ben Dosa's wife wanted to light Shabbat candles and they were so poor. 
And she said to Hanina, she said, uh, she said, Hanina, we don't have, we don't have oil. So he said to her, put water in. So we mean put water in. So the Tamuna, that she, he who makes the oil burn can make the water burn. That was his prayer. So she put in water and the water burned, the candle burned, the candles, the, the burned, the Shabbat candles, they burned from water. This is on the level of Hanina ben Dosa's Amuna. And Hanina ben Dosa had such perfect, simple Amuna. Uh, the great that the story said that Gemara, people with a simplicity. Choni Amagal, Choni Amagal. He was not, there's not a single halacha in the Gemara about Choni Amagal. He didn't say a single halacha. But there was a three year drought, and Choni Amagal says, Hashem, give rain. Hashem, Choni is thirsty. Hashem wants rain. And he drew a circle. That's why I call him Amagal, means a circle. And Hashem, give us rain, and I'm not leaving the circle to get rain. It was rain. It was big rain. The drought broke. This is the simple imuna. That is the power of the tzaddik. That, okay, he's learning it, but he's always focused on imuna. So if a person can be, this is what we call in Hebrew, dveikus, that I cling to Hashem. What do I cling to Hashem? What do you mean to cling to Hashem? Hashem has no bodily properties. That's the third principle of imuna. By, by way of imuna, cling to Hashem. Cling to Hashem. So the great tzaddik, who is all the time honed in on Amuna, his vector is all the time in Amuna, he can learn these chachmot and it won't be, won't go to his, won't go to his brain. It won't make him a uh, wheeler and dealer. For example, a person without Amuna can learn the Gemara in Baba Siya, Baba Basra, and they can be the biggest crook in the world because it can show a wheeler dealer how to do all kinds of combino, all kinds of combinations. And with, with Amuna, it, it's innocence. So that's why our stages say that it is a, an elixir of life or it is a potent of death. If we take all, if we take the Torah especially, take the Torah, if a person learns it by way of philosophy, and this is why we don't know no philosophy. There were philosophers that tried to philosophize the Torah, but it could be, it could be an, a, instead of elixir of life, it could be a, a the drug of death. So this is what, Rabbi Nachman says, he says, it, it takes also what King Solomon said, Shevi pulled Sadik for come. Uh, King Solomon said that seven, a, a, a Sadik falls seven times and gets up. He's uh, alluding that even if a Sadik slips up in, in, in these seven types of wisdom, he'll get up and get back, back, back into Muna. But he says, a warning if we take the Hebrew verse from uh, Proverbs, Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vikam, take the last letter of every word when secret is Torah, it comes out of Malik. It's a big danger, a Malik. Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vikam. And that's a Malik. That's this, a Malik is a stumbling block. And the only way to get up from a Malik stumbling block, because a Malik is a denial of Hashem, is by Emuna, belief in Hashem. So Rabbi Nachman continues, Zesh Katu Moshe Rabbeinu, what Moshe Rabbeinu of Yehid Yadav in the war against Amalek, the Torah says, and the hands of Moses were Amuna. What's the hand of Moses of Amuna? Uncleus explains that Moses raised his hands in prayer. And Moses said that this is what in Aramaic, the Aramaic interpretation of Torah by the, the Holy Tana Uncleus, he says Moses' hands were extended in prayer. And by way of Amuna, that is the way as long as Moses' hands were extended in prayer, that Amalek was weakened and they were defeated. When, Mo when Moses' hands became tired and he dropped his hands, Amalek prevailed. And so what happened, Aaron and Hur, they took a rock and they put, upheld Moses' hands. Moses was a, he was an old man already. He was close to 120 years old. And that was uh, and, and that, that kept his hands up. So by way of uh, this indic indicative of the war between Amuna and Amalek. And so our hands, what's our hands Hill, Rabbi Nachman says that our hands refer to the applied mitzvot. It's not like the philosophers. They sit home, they just talk. They just talk. But my hand, my hand reaches in the pocket and gives a person a charity. My hand makes challah and takes up, gives it to a person. My, my, my does, does for Shabbos. My hand puts on my tefillin. My hand does all types of, of, of different mitzvot. My feet, they take me to the study hall. My feet, I go and do help a little old lady cross the street. My feet do mitzvot. These are not philosophy. These are practical mitzvot. These are practical mitzvot. And that's why King David says in Psalm 119, verse 86, call mitzvot secha emuna. Look what King David says. All your mitzvahs are emuna. So emuna, Rabbi Nachman says, this is, this is an eye opener here. 
which would, and near the conclusion at the end of of, of uh, part two of Torah nineteen, emuna zet fila k'moshe tigem prish on betzilo ki at fila meshane at teva v'nitpatlim achochmot v'achikol shem olchim alpi at teva. Rabbi Nachman says emuna is synonymous to prayer. Emuna and prayer, the same thing. If you believe, you pray. And for a person to pray, he has to believe. And prayer without belief doesn't it, it, it doesn't do much, because prayer and emuna are both up not only above nature, but prayer and emuna they can defy nature. We've seen in our group, in our group, where the doctors have said one thing and uh, emuna says something else. People got better by by emuna. And last night, which you just saw uh, last night. I don't know if, if you joined us last night, right at the end, uh, Catriella Collins from West Virginia, she was stuck with her car. Car got overheated. I said, what to do? I said, right there, okay. They said, take, say Psalm 20. You've been learning Amuna. Tell Hashem, listen, I was learning Amuna, and that's why they get the car running. And she said, Psalm 20. I got an email from her this morning. Rabbi, the car kicked in right away. I got home safely. Oh, Hashem. This is the power of Muna, but you can see it, it. It's no big deal because this is a, a fact that's above nature. This is the way we live. Look how we live in Israel now. I say, I, you know, I think I, I love teaching Rabbi Nachman's teachings. I love being with our group. Okay. And it's now we've been together for about an hour. I have a smile on my face. I've been frowning. You know what's going on in Israel? We're about full at war on. On the northern border, it's crazy. America had just sold us down the river. Okay, no more weapons for Israel. All the nations of the world are against us, Europe. And here we're fighting. Hamas wants to destroy us. Iran wants to destroy us. Uh, Hezbollah wants to destroy us. And Joe Biden says you can't have weapons. Why? Because he's worried about the Michigan, the Arab boat in Michigan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Biden. Okay, but this is, you know, makes me happy. Ezekiel in chapter 14 told me that this would happen. It's like when Rabbi Akiva went into the Holy Temple and the, after the destruction of the Holy Temple, and he was with Rabban Gamliel and Rabban Tar Tarfon, and they, they, they cried. They said, why are you crying? Because the temple is destroyed. They said, why are you laughing? He saw a fox come out of the Holy of Holies. And he says, <laughs> the, the, the same prophet that said the foxes will come out of the Holy of Holies said that Hashem is going to rebuild it and we're going to redeem us. So the same prophecy in Ezekiel that says all the nations are coming is the same prophet that says when it come back. This is this is good news time. This is good news time. If I would have learned with you the Gemara in Sota 49b five years ago, where it says right before Mashiach, the galley is going to be destroyed, you'd say to me, uh, Laser, what do you smoke? I don't smoke. <laughs> I take her myself. But here we see it right before Mashiach. The nations are against all the prophecies are coming together. And that's why uh, we're staying close to home because it's Mashiach here any minute, any minute, wait for, waiting for any minute. And so this is what uh, Rabbi Nachman says, that when Amunus spreads, then all the philosophy is going to be canceled and it's out. Because And he says the main purpose of our Amunah and our prayer is that we be included in Hashem, at one with Hashem, in unity with Hashem. And this is means what it means to walk with Hashem. So now, in conclusion, Rabbi Nachman says, That the philosophers, they interpret the Torah according to their wisdom. I'll give you an example of the way a philosopher interprets the Torah. Philosopher interprets the Torah, and the philosopher says, well, back in the time of the Torah, there was trigonosis and there was no refrigeration, so therefore the Torah prohibited pork. But now that there's a, a medicine they give the, the swine against uh, trigonosis and there's refrigeration, that there's no pork. Get out of here. Get out of here. That's not it. That's what you, your, your stupid philosophy. You know, if you don't eat pork, because... What the Arizal teaches us that what we eat is we ingest in our soul. And the type of food we put in, we ingest the spirituality of that food. So if a person wants the soul with the characteristics of, of swine, then go ahead, eat your pork chops, eat your pork hot dogs, go ahead. And that's why the philosophers, that's why uh, uh, Aristotle could roll around in the gutter. 
And he could talk the big game, roll around the gutter because there was no connection between uh, his soul and, and, and what he did. It's all intellectual philosophizing. And this, uh, according to, to their heresy and wisdom, they can't understand the Torah. So they interpret everything according to their heresy and their wisdom, but they have no applied mitzvot and no amuna. With no applied mitzvot, no practical mitzvot, and no amuna can't possibly understand anything in Torah. It's like a, a bunch of fairy tales for people, heaven forbid. So our sages, Rabbi Nachman says in closing, this is what we understand that a Malik that denied a Malik would cut off foreskins and throw them in the air. And throw them in the air. He would disdain, he would say he would make fun of the Holy Covenant. He would make fun of the Holy Covenant. This is how nasty a Malik was. And a Malik was into everything nasty that came any type of debauchery, any type of evil, any type of murder, any type of stealing, that was a Malik. And this is a Malik. So this is what Rabbi Nachman says, because they interpret everything according to their human intellect and they throw the divine covenant aside. The divine covenant is a Muna. We talk about what is behind. Why does a, why does a person do the holy covenant? B'lit Kodesh? It's all because of Amuna. So they throw this aside. So Rabbi Nachman concludes and he says, Ashrei Mish Yodemim Klal, that happy is the person that doesn't involve himself with the philosophy or philosophers and sticks to simple Amuna. Amuna, Kenal, that's it. Then Rabbi Nathan, Rabbi Nathan includes that this is, in the end, this is, he makes a, a, a little one word conclusion that it, it's all Amuna. So this is Torah 19. I know it's been a mouthful, <laughs> but uh, I, I couldn't break it up into two. It's a little bit too long for one lesson and the, 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 too short for two lessons, but Hashem, we got it together and it was good on thing. You see what the, what the e evil inclination didn't want us to learn Torah 19, but because we had this mix up with the, the links and, and torch, but, but Bezrat Hashem, I'll straighten it out during the week with Rabbi Wolby, but uh, it's good. There's a way to beat the inclination. Beloved brothers and sisters, have a wonderful Shabbat and a wonderful new month of ER. And it's so delightful to see everybody and that special treat. I got uh, Nisim Black with us tonight. Hi, Nisim. Big hug. Big hug, my brother. And everything wonderful. All your heart's wishes for the best. And look forward to seeing you next week on Likute Moran. God bless.